Okay, folks, we're back today, and we're going to continue. Uh, we're going into our discussion on gravitational mechanics and the contribution of this science uh, in studying the examination of the flood of Noah's day. Uh, first off, uh, one student reminded me of two items I left out in our discussion of meteorology, which I want to mention very quickly and briefly. Uh, one was the <clears throat> inversion uh, layers which uh, defined the different layers of the atmosphere from the uh, troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the ionosphere. What establishes a layer definition in the atmosphere is the uh, inversion uh, points where the temperature reverses uh, and begins to either get hotter or colder. In the case of uh, this, where the stratosphere begins from the surface of the earth up to the stratosphere, uh, if if you go up in altitude every thousand feet, the air will get cooler. But once you reach the stratosphere, uh, it reverses and begins to get warmer every as you go up uh, in altitude, and then it reverses again as you go up to the next layer, and so on and so on. Also, I forget I, I forgot to mention uh, or neglected to mention is the word. Uh, the different layers uh, that we normally don't really look at in a meteorological sense, but uh, that nevertheless do play a role. We have, uh, such as the ionosphere, uh, higher up in the atmosphere, and, and, and we also have below that in the uh, lower levels uh, a very important layer that has to do with our health and many other things is the ozone layer uh, of charged particles, which uh, I'm a lot of people believe that it's very possible, and I also do, that in the times of Noah, before the flood of Noah, that the ozone layer may have been much, much thicker. Uh, it may have uh, greatly affected many things uh, as far as the uh, genetic endurance of uh, living animals uh, as well as plants. Uh, it could have had uh, a great effect. Of course, you know, there's many things that affect that. On up, you have the Van Allen belt uh, higher out there a few hundred miles that uh, protects uh, uh, from certain types of bombardment of uh, radioactive uh, radiation particles from the cosmos. And out from that, you have the um, uh, magnetic, the magnosphere out there the, where you have the Earth's magnetic field, uh, which uh, also is the major protector of life on Earth uh, from radiation from the cosmos. So I didn't mention those two, so I thought I'd throw them in right quick up front here. So let's move on to gravity. <clears throat> uh, for a really in-depth study of gravity itself and the mechanics of gravity and the study of gravity, there's a lot of good sources you can go on to online. So we're going to briefly just cover just a few things about gravity and gravity mechanics that are important in, in the consideration that we're going to go into in our hypothesis of the cause and effect uh, of the great uh, meteorological stir of events during the time of Noah's flood and uh, what we think may have caused that. Uh, of course, God caused it. God ordained it, but uh, the, the forces of nature at play uh, that God ordained. So we're going to go there. Let's look at gravity. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, when we're talking about gravity in the solar system, certain, uh, from our perspective, uh, certain bodies, uh, such as the sun, helos, the moon, luna, and the earth, terra firma, are the three major considerations. Uh, these are the, and then the planets, of course, uh, in the normal mechanics of, uh, the local systems of gravity that we consider in our examination. Now, the effect of uh, tidal forces from the sun and the moon on the earth affect both the oceans by measurable amounts uh, and the seas. Uh, also, they have an effect on the shape of the atmosphere from one side of the earth to the other. It's one of the contributors to uh, what causes wind on the surface of the earth. Of course, there's other significant contributors, mainly heat energy from the sun as the earth rotates. But gravity also affects the shape of the atmosphere. Gravity affects the shape of the earth uh, as it rotates. 
and the tidal forces exerted on the earth from the moon uh, affects uh, the shape of the earth. A lot of folks don't realize that. There is actually a bulging effect on the earth from the tidal forces from the subterranean uh, ethosphere and the magma core. Uh, the magma core, anything fluid. The magma core is fluid. The ethosphere is fluid. The uh, thin layer of the lithosphere, the solid surface that we live on, is very thin compared to the measured layers of the earth. So keeping that in mind, we've already talked about that a bit. So what we want to go to is uh, we know that uh, gravity influences affect the actual shape of the earth. And we also know that that shape is, uh, as, as a general rule, it's, it, it doesn't vary a great amount as we rotate, such as the, the tides of the oceans varies by measurable amounts that uh, are fairly significant. Um, <clears throat> as the tide goes out, the tide comes in uh, from the influence of the gravity of the moon. But uh, we don't notice uh, quite the same significance in measurement from the gravity of the sun because of the proximity, because it's uh, 90 something million miles away, whereas the moon is 240,000 miles or so on average. So it's closer. The moon has the gravity about one sixth that the Earth exerts. Gravity is a product of mass objects displacing space. Uh, Einstein had some pretty um, innovative descriptions of the theoretics of describing the science of gravitation, uh, the descriptions of gravity scientifically. Uh, just a few more things you need to know about gravity itself is gravity influence is measurable uh, about at the same speed as light. Uh, light travels at uh, 300 meters per, uh, 300,000 meters per second, 186,000 miles per second. Uh, so, uh, it's uh, the gravitation uh, in, in light relationship uh, as far as the velocity uh, effect, not the velocity of gravitational force, but the effect of gravity. It's tied in with the speed of light also, so that's interesting to know. Um, gravity is a predictable force within the solar system pretty much uh, as, as far as an average that makes space flight to the outer planets possible. If it were not predictable uh, on average, then we wouldn't be able to navigate space probes to the outer planets. It would be too difficult to calculate. So anyway, that being figured. Now, what we're going to look at is objects that could exert enough gravitational effect. Now, we're going to call that the lensing effect, gravitational lensing. Okay, what is gravitational lensing? All right, <clears throat> if you... Uh, Depending on where you, let, let's, let's use us as our test object. If I were standing, uh, on a position location on Earth and a heavy gravity object, let's just say the moon, uh, were directly above me, the gravitational effect it would have on me, of course now we're using the moon, we could use another body that maybe even exerted more gravity, for, for now we use the moon. It would have an effect uh, that would almost be similar to what would be a canceling effect of the overall average of the Earth gravity. Meaning what? Meaning that I would weigh less on that position than I would on the opposite side of the Earth. On the opposite side of the Earth, I would have the gravity of the Earth and the moon on the other side uh, effect in alignment, which would cause me to weigh more. On the moon side of the earth where I'm facing the moon and looking at the moon the lensing effect of the two in other words the uh, the almost opposite effect so to speak would tend to uh, of the two forces uh, uh, seemingly working in opposition to one another is relative to me would cause that I would be a measurably amount of, of uh, lower uh, weight than I would be on the other side. Now, let's look at some uh, mechanics that affect the uh, way gravity operates on an object. For instance, uh, relative speed in position relative to the body. Like in the case of a jet airplane, let's use a supersonic airplane traveling at supersonic uh, above Mach going east. And uh, the weight of his fuel in the same jet going west. 
the aircraft that would be traveling from west to east would get better fuel economy, uh, not considering wind. Now, if we take the wind occasion out, such as tailwind or headwind, and just consider static wind condition, the jet traveling east would get better fuel economy than the one traveling west. Why? Because the earth is spinning from west to east, and the centrifugal effect of that rotation from the earth uh, would cause uh, the, a lighter weight of the fuel on the, uh, well, the aircraft and the fuel. Uh, plus the added speed would increase the rotation added to what the earth is already rotating. So traveling east, you have the speed of the rotation of the earth and also the added speed of the velocity, the speed of the jet aircraft. Uh, that's taking away from the gravity. It's kind of like slinging a ball on a string. Whereas going west, uh, west you would uh, cancel out, uh, if you were traveling above Mach, the uh, advantage of the rotation of the Earth, taking it back closer to zero advantage, uh, closer towards that, in other words, and also uh, that would uh, cause you to be heavier. So the fuel would be heavier, the aircraft would be heavier, and all its arguments, payload. So that being considered, that's part of orbital mechanics. That comes into play when you figure out how fast you got to go to escape Earth's gravity, uh, where does the satellite get positioned in orbit, how fast does he have to go, at what altitude, all those things come into play. We're not going to go there, but they are factors. So where that becomes a factor is if a rogue <coughs> high gravity object were to come in proximity of Earth that were of a high gravity enough effect to where it affected the stability of the orbit of the moon, affected to extremes the tidal forces of the fluids uh, in the Earth's composition, which would be the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the ethosphere, and the magmasphere. All of those are fluid. The only thing that would be considered not fluid, and it also, I'm going to say, is flexible, is the lithosphere. When I say flexible, it moves. It moves about its uh, place of adjoinment, its fault lines, and all that kind of thing. And it distorts. Uh, where does it distort? Uh, it, if you take and measure tides on the Earth, uh, you can see pretty much an extreme example of how the tidal effects of the gravity of the moon affect uh, a measured amount of, of change in the ocean from when the tide goes out and comes in. The tidal effect on the fluid of the inner core of the Earth are the same. Uh, it, it also affects the pressures exerted by those fluid and, uh, shall we say, plastic fluid type heated uh, subterranean molten layers of, of composites and rock and magma, etc. And also the gas spheres within the core of the Earth. So the gravitational effect of passing heavy objects, such as the moon, have a uh, effect on all fluid for uh, movements within the uh, composition of the Earth. Now, am I saying that caused flow is, uh, the flood of Noah? No. Because in the measurements of the moon, we have a fairly, uh, in the effects of the moon and the sun, we have a fairly predictable uh, and balanced type of action taking place that's really beneficial. For instance, the gravitational pull of the sun, the heating of the sun, and the pull of the moon distorts the atmosphere in such a way as to where it, it's one of the contributors that uh, uh, contributes to the winds of the earth. It keeps the wind moving where it will just stay still. Of course, also the heating of the sun across the surface also is a, the major contributor contributor there, but it, but the gravity of the moon is also one of the contributors. The actual shape of the atmosphere is affected from one side of the earth to the other by outside gravity forces, tidal forces we'll call them, and uh, <clears throat> this is also measurable. The actual crust of the earth, now we, we talked about volcanology in, in our earlier classes, now it is actually a term of volcanology called bulging. Bulging is when tidal forces on the magma uh, inner cores uh, in the ethosphere, which we talked about, are actually distorted by gravitational forces or pre 
pressures from other sources, for internal forces, stresses within the earth. But it is a fact that it does occur. Now, how extreme bulging effects depends on the uh, level of the uh, object doing the effecting, the gravity, for instance. So let's go into that area. Uh, now, we're going to get into the antiquity literatures in our next discussion. So right now, I need to introduce just a little bit of that to let you know where we're going. One of the things we're going to look at is where it says the foundations of the deep were broken up. Now, that's in one of the landscape literatures we're going to go to. The Bible actually says the fountains of the deep were broken up also. Now, uh, when we say uh, fountains of the deep in, in the Bible, uh, in one of the landscape literatures, it goes so far as to say the foundations of the deep. So, when we consider what is a fountain, a fountain is usually water. It could be a fountain of fire in the case of a volcano. But now, in, in the case of a flood, we're thinking of water. And it's more appropriate in this case. But the foundations of the deep uh, for water would be the uh, oceanic uh, subterranean crustal surfaces. Now, what could uh, cause the floors of the ocean to begin to distort in such a way as to where the actual shape of the crust. Now, the shape of the crust of the earth, uh, the crust of the earth is a very thin layer in comparison to the size of the earth. Now, it's it's not one of the major spheres. Of course, we consider it a major sphere because we live on it. We depend on the solid structure below us. But the crust of the earth is uh, measured anywhere from 35 to, uh, depending on where you measure, over 100 miles. Um, uh, it, it depends on where you're measuring the crust of earth before you get to the ethosphere, through the lithosphere. But the Earth's shape is affected uh, by major uh, outside events. One, one, first off, the rotation of the Earth causes a distortion of the shape of the exterior of the Earth in the lithosphere. Now, this is established because the rotation of the Earth is pretty well established over a long period of time. So it has adjusted itself to where, the, it, with the exception of times when you have uh, certain forces move and you have fault lines slip, and volcanics blow up and explode, uh, you don't see the effect on a daily basis, or even an annual basis, but over long periods of time. But in a unique event, such as the passing of a heavy gravity object through the solar system, then if it, if it were to pass this heavy, and I'm skipping over some things, I'm going to get there, but if you were to look at a heavy gravity object, that exerted uh, a high level of gravity on a planetary scale uh, pass in such coincidences to where its effect affected the tidal forces of the exterior and interior of the Earth and distorted the shape of the crust of the Earth. It wouldn't have to really, on average, distort the shape of the Earth that much for the oceans to flow out over the land. What I'm saying is the, the foundations of the deep would be broken up in relationship to the surface, that the solid surface we're used to living on, the dry land. Now, if the ocean floors, even only one, let's say the Pacific Ocean floors, or the upper Atlantic, uh, Mediterranean area, were affected. If it wasn't, and it would, only, it would be on one side or the other, because both sides of the earth wouldn't be distorted in the same direction. It would, it would be like an out of balance situation. You'd have the bulging on one side toward the gravity object. Now let's just say, that, for instance, it was the Pacific Ocean, which is our largest body of identifiable water hydrosphere surface. Now if the ocean floor were to be exposed on that side of the earth, uh, and the mag magnosphere and the ethosphere below it, were to have tidal forces exerted on it by the passing of a heavy gravity object over a period of weeks or months, then at one point or another, the exerted concentrated forces could cause a bulging effect from the interior of the Earth to where the Earth would be distorted enough on that side as to where the, the actual floor of the Earth itself would push upward 
and the waters of that ocean body would have to flow out somewhere. Where would they go? They would go onto the land surfaces. Now, <clears throat> uh, somebody might say, oh, well, my goodness, that would certainly trigger all kinds of volcanic activity along the fault lines. Yes, it would. It certainly would. And it would be major. And it would be cataclysmic. And in one of the landscape literatures, I'm going to read to you where it accounts uh, at that flood, where it makes this statement. And the smell of sulfur was in the air. Now, sulfur is associated with volcanic activity. So it's just a tidbit that is in the landscape literatures, one of the qualified landscape literatures, by the way. So we're going to get there tomorrow. We're going to, we're going to go into that in our next class. In, when, when we compare our literature examples. But before we leave the gravitational lensing effect today, uh, I have to mention uh, the, we, we talked about the uh, meteorological stir of events. When you're talking about gravitational forces, they have a, a, a of that type of magnitude, uh, of a passing heavy gravity object through the solar system in close proximity to the Earth. Now, how close would it have to be? It wouldn't have to be that close. Several million miles away would would exert tremendous a, a planetary size. Would, it would exert tremendous gravitational force, especially a moving object at the right angles it would cause a lensing effect of gravity that would be a a very very uh, notable event in in the effects it would have on nature on Earth and if you have to remember that in the energy exchanges of such things, the tremendous energy you're going to affect, especially with gravity distorting the shape of the atmosphere, and understand when you distort the shape of the atmosphere a great amount, you affect the layers of the atmosphere. You affect where those layers are defined, such as the inversion points, and all of this is exemplified in a thunderstorm. When you see lightning strike, have you ever been close, and I know most of you have, to a very powerful bolt of lightning? And, and you know how it makes you just jump all of a sudden. It's so fast and hits. That is an example of energy. Energy that is released in a hydrocycle stir of events just inside one thunderstorm cloud. Now imagine... A thunderstorm that would cover half the earth, not a thunderstorm, but a cyclonic event, such as a hurricane. Now understand that when you have one that large, most hurricanes uh, extend, even the largest ones, uh, level five, uh, say, is hundreds of miles from side to side. But in one like this, where it would actually cross the equator, you would have forces in opposition to each other, to where that they would actually be two forces in collision with one another, which would create a unique type of hydro uh, stir. And what would happen there in your atmosphere being distorted and all the energies being released is you would have a unique, what people today would just call a freak storm, something that just doesn't happen on a normal occurrence. Now, this type of storm would be such that it could easily be considered to be almost on a global scale. Now, I know that sounds contradictory to the Bible when I say almost, but remember it would affect other things, such as your ice structures. The ice structures on the Earth, when you look at the North Pole and you look at the South Pole, the Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, anything that would affect the temperatures of the Earth and the shift of the levels of the ocean would cause tremendous disruptions in the structures of the ice formations on the Earth. Not to mention, remember I talked about latent change of state, latent temperature? What happens when you melt ice? You go through latent change. When you create ice from a liquid uh, water situation, latent change. And what I say happens at latent change is your degree of calorie temperature, energy measurement, the actual energy measurement per calorie of, uh, in a, let's just say a cubic centimeter of water, seven times what it is through normal temperature changes. At that change, you have tremendous energy. So what are we doing? We're combining several different types of energy exchange, which drives the storm. And what we have is we have a, stu a super storm 
that is described in literature in a way that humans have a difficult time describing. It's so great on such a scale. And we're going to also read, uh, where do we have evidence to support this before any of you decide to cut off this lecture? Uh, in the book of Jasher, recommended by the Bible in three places, once in the New Testament, twice in the Old Testament, says that the mountains, when, when, when the flood began, when the storm began, that the earth, there was a great noise, that the sky turned dark immediately, and that the mountains moved lightly. Now, folks, have you ever looked and watched and saw a mountain move? Those of you that were in the mountains during an earthquake, you possibly actually saw the fluid effect of an earthquake. What happens to the ground in an earthquake is the ground actually becomes like a fluid. It shifts. It moves around. It's it's quite a frightening event. But in Jasher, it actually describes that the mountains moved lightly. Well, friend, I want to tell you, any kind of force that actually literally moves the mountains is uh, hard to describe lightly. It's, it's, it's a heavy event. And uh, the, the events point to something more than just a hydrocycle event. The hydrocycle event is part of it, the flood, naturally. Also, it talks about the waters being up on every high mountain. Now, I take this by interpretation. Not necessarily to mean that every high mountain was submerged. I have no doubt some were. But it doesn't necessarily mean that every high mountain was submerged. It simply means that waters were upon every high mountain. In other words, that the storm was so severe, the storm was so intense, and so huge, such a mega global event, that every high mountain was being slammed by the waters of the storm which would be an intolerable event for anyone trying to live in such a situation. Uh, it would wash you off the mountain, basically, down into the floodwaters below. So when we begin to study this, and we begin to look at the flood of Noah, we've got to understand that this is not an ordinary uh, description of events on a regular routine weather pattern type thing. Something extraordinary was taking place. Now, there's evidences in the landscape literatures that we're going to get into next. All I'm doing is kind of laying some basic scientific descriptions out here right now to show you just how devastating such a phenomenon of nature could be under certain circumstances that we are able to make. We're going to get into some landscape literatures that's going to show evidences of the possibility of a high-gravity object entering into our solar system that contributes to our hypothesis at this point. We're not going to go into it yet. We're going to get there in our next class. But we're also going to look at uh, sources that validate that the flood was a fact of antiquities, literature. That literature leaves no doubt by comparisons with common threads from the different sources that the flood was a fact of literature. Now, I'm going to stand on that statement. It was not a fictional event of literature. It was a fact of literature that is assumed in the antiquities to be a fact, that it truly did happen. Now, we're going to look tomorrow at some of the descriptions, and then we're going to determine in the uh, comparative theology science, between theology and science, and we're going to try to establish probability of was this actually a scientifically sound description of events when we combine the Holy Bible as our authoritative statement, and then we also look at the contributing supplemental statements of the antiquities of the landscape literature. And I, I think, personally, it's very fascinating. The possibilities are bigger than any of us can imagine. God has, uh, in his technological ability, uh, the ability to do things that, that, that we can't even imagine because we're not God and his ways are above our ways. He didn't even have to use any of this. He's that advanced. He's that powerful. He's that great. But with us, it's within our ability to try to understand in such a way as to we can help others. 
Help others see that, yes, this is more sound than what you think it is. This is not a ridiculous fictional story. This actually happened. And we're trying to equip ourselves in such a way as to where that we can defend that argument and believe it ourselves. To where that we're positioning ourselves to defend a statement from the Holy Scriptures that we actually believe, that we're sure of. And that's where we're going. Well, this is Dr. Alan Childs inviting you to be with us for our next class when we're going to go into the examination of what the Holy Bible had to say regarding Noah's flood. And we're going to look at what the landscape literatures that support within their statements, descriptions of details, and we're going to put together a beautiful picture of a very horrible event from the standpoint of those who lived through it. And a very difficult uh, journey for Noah and the, well, for all of the eight souls on the earth. So God bless you, and we'll see you when we continue our next class. This is Dr. Alan Childs. Farewell.